Champions for Maine Birds. Um, I'm Nick Lund, Advocacy and Outreach Manager for Maine Audubon. And? And Doug Hitchcock, the staff naturalist here. Um, thanks for coming on. Before we get started, just a couple notes. One is that if you would like to enable closed captioning, you can usually do that down along the bottom of your Zoom screen there. Um, search for it. It may say captions or CC. Um, Doug warned me beforehand that it's not good at hearing bird names. And so you may get a closed caption for everything except the bird name that we say. Apologies, we're doing the best we can. Um, we um, talk in the chat, if you can, the chat just to us. So there'll be uh, uh, some polls, some interactive th uh, things as we go along to talk out about this exciting topic, which is that we have an opportunity now, whether you like it or not, to come up with new names for a whole bunch of birds. And so um, Doug's gonna talk to you now about the decision. And um, then we're gonna dive into uh, some names that Doug and I have come up as just suggestions for some birds um, uh, found in Maine. So Doug, why don't you take it away here? Yeah, and uh, before diving in, I'll make the quick plug. Hopefully, everyone, if you by the time you found this link, I've gotten involved. Um, I hope you're well aware of Maine Audubon and what we do. But I do just want to make the plug that uh, you know we love being able to do programs like this and things like our birding basics that are starting up uh, with the new year. We have new virtual birding series that Andy Kapanos, our our field naturalist, is doing. He's also got a a win, uh, botany in winter virtual series. Uh, we are able to do all of those for free uh, thanks to member support um, from people like you. So if you're not already a member, please consider uh, um, joining, becoming a member, um, or making a donation. And, and thank you to the folks. Um, we did see some donations come in even with this event tonight. So we really appreciate that support. And you can help us uh, keep the lights on by supporting our work to connect Maine um, uh, Mainers with uh, Maine's wildlife and, and protect its habitats. So as Nick kind of teed up, uh, this is what we're going to talk about. This announcement that came out from the AOS that they were going to be changing um, uh, some bird names. Before kind of diving into this, I do want to kind of set the stage. Um, I realize a lot of folks might not even know who the AOS is, what they do. So let's take one step back, literally, <laughs> to their, their homepage. We're talking about the American Ornithological Society. Um, depending on kind of your, uh, again, background in history, you might know this group uh, formerly as the AOU, the American Ornithological Union, um, had joined with the Cooper Society to form uh, what is now called the, the AOS. So even uh, their own name has changed. It's a global nonprofit that really focuses on advancing scientific study and conservation of birds. So doing stuff, um, again, globally, all over the world, and uh, uh, really anything that, that has to do with, with ornithology and, and conservation. Um, one example I always like to give, uh, especially like if you come to Maine Audubon, you might see like shelves that are, are covered with these old issues of the AUK. That is one of the old journals that they used to um uh put out so if you ever see those or see old um uh you know papers and, and publications from the awk that's that's thanks thanks to the well aou at that time one of the many things that the aos does um is they have this um uh excuse me this group the nacc north american classification committee and their role is to evaluate uh, and codify basically the latest in systematics, nomenclature, and distribution of, of um, North and Middle American birds. What that means is these are the names that we use. Uh, basically all of the, whether you're using eBird and you see the, the list of common names that are in there and the names that are in your uh, field guide, those are really nicely standardized amongst birds thanks to the AOS and the NACC. Uh, as a naturalist, I always appreciate that we have this really nice kind of standardized way, especially when I start looking through like a plant field guide, and you'll see the same plant can have like six or eight different common names. Um, and it becomes like really confusing to talk about. And then you meet some like real plant nerds that only use like Latin binomials. And, and I don't think that that's helpful at all. So having good standardized common names, especially thanks to um, the OS here. It's really helpful. I want to point out, uh, you know, 
we're going to have fun tonight talking about this this big change. This is um, essentially unprecedented in the the scope of, or the scale of it. Um, but birders do this every year. If you're a fan of the American Birding Association, they do um, multiple blog posts. They do uh, podcast episodes every year where they kind of go through all the different uh, proposals, different changes that the AOS has uh, put forth. There's usually three rounds of proposals every year, um, again, to update everything from names, taxonomy, and even um, uh, just updating that checklist with uh, proper distributions of birds. So with that in mind, that, that part of the, the AOS, which does so much, one part of them, one committee is this NACC, uh, that is in charge of setting these standardized bird names. Um, since 2019, they've been kind of looking at, uh, at bird names, uh, specifically those, uh, the eponyms, the birds that are named after people, um, and trying to come up with kind of a, 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 a new way to, to think about them, how to interpret them, um, and that's what this, on, on November 1st, this big announcement came out that basically made three commitments. And that's what I just want to go through real quick. The first one, uh, the first commitment was that they would change all the bird names directly after people. And then there are a couple other names um, uh, deemed offensive uh, uh, to different populations. So those were would change as well. Um, the interesting thing about this is that there had already been some cases. Uh, McCown's long spur was kind of the, the very popularized example. Um, McCown was a uh, um, uh, Civil War, uh, what was his rank, general? Uh, Nick might know this better. Anyways, he was a, a avid proponent of slavery, literally fought for it. Um, there should not be a, a bird named after him. McCown's Longspur was renamed as Thick-Billed Longspur. Um, around that time, so 2019 was when uh, some of these proposals were first uh, uh, being made, and it was realized that there are a lot of birds named after people that probably shouldn't be. And that's what started this whole debate. You can look at uh, the AOS, uh, especially at some of their like annual conferences, um, started basically having these conversations and, and opening up um, uh, different groups to, to get input and basically figure out uh, what should be done. The quick answer, uh, or, or the quick answer I'll give after this multi-year process is they decided to just change all the names. Rather than going through a case-by-case -case basis that could take an incredibly long time and really the the almost endless debate that would go on be would come down to essentially value judgments and and kind of focus on this like human morality of like what what do we deem acceptable what is something that is like bad enough that the, someone shouldn't have a bird named after them there are certainly plenty of people that uh to the best of our knowledge like did great things great advancements in ornithology that do have birds named after them so rather than trying to like draw a line somewhere on this spectrum, uh, again, which which come down to value judgments, they decided why not just change um, all eponyms um, and not have to make that call. The real quick number is that that comes down to um, uh, about 152 English names that are within the NACC's uh, region which is um, in total about 5% of English names. So I have to I hear a lot of people say like, oh, this is, this is gonna be so many new names we have to learn and bird names change all the time. This is gonna be a big change, you know, in, in a relatively short time frame, but uh, about 5% is, is really not that bad. Especially when you think like there were some changes this year. Did people realize goshawk? got changed thanks to a, a taxonomic split. The, the Northern goshawk is now called the American goshawk. Last couple, um, uh, the other two commitments to mention, um, this idea that they would actually establish a committee to oversee the assignment of common names because uh, 
right now, uh, or I should say past committees basically really focused on taxonomy. Those were the experts, you know, that were in that room coming up with these new names. And they realized that they needed these committees to be more diverse um, in their knowledge of culture, of public communication, outreach, education, like why not have all these voices uh, essentially in the room when it comes to coming up with uh, these new names? Um, in this idea, like a fun thing to look at all of these proposals that have come through over the years, um, one that I always like sticks out in my mind, one of my favorite birds in the world is a salt marsh sparrow. That's a species in Maine that was recently added to the Maine endangered species list. Um, there was a proposal just a few years ago to change the name of salt marsh sparrow to Peterson's sparrow, to, to turn it into an eponym, name it after Roger Tory Peterson, to fit in with Alcantes and Nelsons, these other eponym, eponymic uh, bird names like within uh, these similar looking birds. And kind of interesting, I, I think it's interesting that like the AOS, that committee decided not to change that name just just to honor this this great person. So if anything, you know, uh, uh, we've been skewing this way uh, long before any of these other changes with Macau. Although there still have been some recently. There wasn't Rivoli's Hummingbird, uh, just the new name of Magnificent, or am I making that up? Yeah. Uh, they, they, there are, uh, this is a big shift away, and I think it's a really smart shift overall, uh, just away from the potential uh, moral questions that our future people will have to face there are plenty of cool ways to honor people. We can put statues up. We can make uh, books in their honor. We can can do other things. Um, and, but I think this is the first time the, the body is saying naming living species after them, just not the right way to do it. And then this kind of gets us to the, the last commitment, which is basically why we're doing this tonight. The last commitment was that they were going to involve the public in the process of selecting new names. Um, this is a really fun thing to think about that if you can engage the public, especially looking for public input for coming up with these new names, that has got to be one of the most like powerful grassroots ways um, to get this this kind of new level of buy-in from the public that will hopefully uh, get people to care more about these birds. We know that you know overall biodiversity loss is is just a huge threat um, as we're seeing from from all sorts of different um, angles, different sources. So being able to get more people involved and again, getting this level of buy-in, I think is is going to have um, hopefully some, some uh, great uh, long-term gain for these species. The last point I wanna make before I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Nick for a second, um, you know, the, there's, there's lots of, criticisms out there of like, why spend time and effort on this? I want, and and we've tried to emphasize, this is just a small committee, a small thing that the AOS does. So for all the naysayers or skeptics out there, the AOS does an absolutely amazing amount of work. This is literally, this is the group that can, you know, make a, a uh, make the step, make the change that can make birding more inclusive. Um, if you're concerned about the AOS, you know, and, and what their uh, priorities are, remember, NACC is about changing bird names. I'd encourage everyone to check out the AOS and all the amazing stuff they do. Maybe consider becoming a member. Um, I was just looking through their, their tw uh, 2022 annual report where just in that year they had uh, provided $134,000 in research support, um, which... I, I won't just read this to you, but I'll encourage everyone to go maybe download this report off their website um, and check out all the amazing uh, work that the AOS is doing in addition to uh, coming up with, with new bird names. And it's important to note here that Maine Audubon is itself named after someone, someone with a checkered pass, as we know, John James Audubon. And a question arises, as in this process of renaming birds, is Maine Audubon considering renaming itself? Well, we are, well, along with uh, many other Audubon societies around the country. As you know, we are not all, we are not linked. Many of us are in different places. Um, we are engaging in a very uh, thoughtful and uh, process about considering our name and what that means and, and what it doesn't mean. 
Um, it's a, I'm proud to say that this is a very, uh, it's a more thoughtful and involved process than I think any other Audubon that I've ever heard of is engaging in. We are talking with all kinds of uh, folks around the state, uh, our members, uh, uh, partner groups, all kinds of people to really understand what our name means to people, what it means to us, and um, what the implications are of, uh, of it. So um, we don't have an answer yet. We are in the thick of this process, which will continue for some time, um, but we are thinking about it very seriously. The next thing, and, and I realize this slide's a little out of order. This was kind of, this was the, the last minute thing we realized. Let's come back. Let's come back to this. Can we come right. back to this later? Great. Okay. Great. Uh, Sorry. So, this was... All right. All right. So, well, yeah. No, uh, the fun thing to now think about is like, where do bird names come from? What makes a you know a, a a good name for lack of a better way of of describing it ring neck duck here being one of those species that is just kind of a horrible name it's only under like the best lighting situations that you can actually see that ring on the neck meanwhile they have this amazing ring around their bill like why why i think the point the start here as we in, start with this process of figuring out what the new names for these birds are uh, is we have to remind ourselves that it, they don't make a lot of sense, that this is, uh, there isn't any such thing as a, a perfect bird name. There are birds all over the map that um, doesn't make that, that sort of are badly named or aren't perfectly named or names that are weird. Um, we're going to get into this point of figuring out what, what we suggest for new names for these birds, but there is no, uh, the arguments are just getting started. There is no sort of answer a lot of times. And so we want to talk to you a little bit about where some of the birds that we currently have, where'd they get them? That was a good pun. There is no answer as we look at a duck and anseriform. Uh, ooh. <laughs> um, uh, so a fun thing to think about is where where do these bird names come from? And especially what we'll consider some of the, the better names. And, and there's this fun spectrum to think about where we see these ones, you know, this bird here, yellow-headed blackbird. What a fantastic name. It's descriptive of the bird's appearance. Even if you showed this bird to someone who was not a bird watcher and you said, hey, what what would you call this bird? Uh, <laughs> yellow-headed blackbird would probably be one of the first things you say. It's a fun one to think about with like red-winged blackbird, a, a more common bird here in Maine is, is one we often talk about kind of in the, the same idea. Uh, but Nick and I actually just last month took a trip to California, and one of the, the target birds we were looking for there is called tricolored blackbird. And it's funny to think about where here in Maine, all the red winged blackbirds actually have like the three colors. Um, you get that extra, the, that color in the wing. So, But I, but I want to jump in and say, even this can be difficult too. Some people have noted in the chat that a lot of the names that are descriptive of the, of the appearance are often only named for the male's plumage, uh, which is often, you know, brighter and has certain things. And so there's a whole other body of, you know, name considerations out there. We are saying, well, are we leaving out an entirety, an entire half of the population by naming a descriptive out only after the males. So that's something that we that is in our world as we're thinking about these things. Yeah, so is it just after the males? Is it where most of the population is? So there's a lot of birds that are named after certain locations. Uh, this is a fun example, especially because it was a recent name change. Uh, for a long time, you know, I bet most most of your field guides probably still call this a uh, gray jay. They were renamed as the Canada Jay. The fun thing to think about with that is I took this photo in Maine, not in Canada at all. Um, so it's, again, uh, uh, there's there's this um, focus sometimes on, on the brightly colored males, on where those birds uh, generally occur. Even the word common can be really confusing when they're not common in your area. And Sometimes. I also, and I, can I jump in on this? I mean, I think yeah. it's also important that a lot of the uh, uh, location, the geographic names are ludicrous, right? Uh, Connecticut warbler is what? In Connecticut for a day, a year, maybe? 
um, Savannah Sparrow, I think is named because it was shot first in Savannah, you know, it's wherever it was uh, just coming through. And so uh, these names are not being reconsidered, but there's something in the world that we can think about it again, as we think of new names, although um, they're, I find they're very rarely useful unless it's a very small population of something. Yeah, like the, here's another one, Cape May Warbler, uh, which breeds all across the boreal forest. Um, yeah, they migrate through, but, you know, a lot of these birds were named where those type specimens were collected, and it's not helpful. Another thing we think about a lot is is the these comparative names. Um, a bird's name, you know, might make sense in terms of, like, the... the um, total family of those birds, in this case, least tern, it is the smallest tern around. So like, that's a great name, right? But when you start thinking about some other things, like Nick and I the other day were talking about like least sandpiper. Yeah, super helpful because it is the smallest sandpiper, but it's always interesting when, when it's in a flock and maybe you have other birds around it to compare to, like, then it, it, is helpful, but one of the most common misidentifications I see is, you know, as an eBird reviewer looking through photos, the number of people that upload something like, you know, a lone pectoral sandpiper. Uh, this is a bird that superficially looks just like a least sandpiper, the, the brownish red on the back, the yellowish legs, um, maybe a droop in the bill. Uh, but these things are, I don't know the size, maybe close to twice the size of a least sandpiper. Um, without the context of, of anything to compare it to, these, uh, again, comparative names um, might not be the most helpful. And, and I also think there's something sort of, um, there, there's an inherent sort of lack of dignity when your name is something just in relation to another bird. It's like, you don't even have your own thing. You're just like, it's in relation to another bird. Like, it's not... That's such a lame name. Not to mention the fact that for birds like lesser or least, that's a sort of an inherently negative name uh, as part of it. It's like a, it's sort of a downer. Uh, and I feel like those aren't right either. And <laughs> in that same idea, here's lesser blackback gull. Um, it's the smaller one. It does have, you know, we can argue what black really is here. Um, <laughs> if folks can't see uh in the comment there is the the mediocre yellow legs was just suggested as a <laughs> a bird name that's very good craig um as nick was saying like uh uh i i appreciate this one lesser blackback gull so does lesser imply that there is one that's greater turns out there's great blackback gull it's great because it's the largest gull there is but it's not even greater it's not even one of these like comparative um uh names so very funny to me to have this you know one one that's comparative and one that is just great also funny to think about like great blackback gull to this point of is it male centric is it adult centric uh here let me go back. Great adult, great blackback gull. Fantastic name. It's got a black back. It's great in size. And it's a gull. The young ones, this is a, a juvenile, uh, doesn't have a black back. Um, it's still great. He's great. Look at him. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, it's it's another one of these like not so helpful names. And again, like our whole point here is that we're just trying to, um, as we'll come up with our suggestions, uh, we want to acknowledge that like there's it's so tough to to do this to come up with names orange crowned warbler have yeah, you we're ever... just lowering the bar for what's going to happen <laughs> later on yeah. orange crown warbler have you ever seen an orange crown on it pomeranian what a cool word i always thought it had something to do with like mer moraine marine environment or something and it was only in working on this program that i looked up Pomerine actually refers to, it's it's to have a nostril covered with a scale, is what that word means. Horrible. You're never going to see the nostril covered with a scale. We know semi-palmated plover, the old world uh, um, common ringed plover. Oh, it must be the one that doesn't have palmation on its toes. Right, and that was one it. just to... Jump in, uh, uh, as Patrick noted in the in the chat, uh, short build and long build dowagers. There are some descriptive names that are just unhelpful completely. Red-bellied woodpecker, 
you know, if you're, if you're on your knees looking at the palmations on the toes of these plovers, then good for you, but that's not the most helpful name that you can come up with. Nick, want to take this fun one? Sure. Not to mention some of my favorite names are completely not descriptive of anything. They're just, uh, uh, you know, made up words. Most of the time named after their, the, the call of the bird or the translated call of a bird over time. Um, a lot of bird names that we have have their origins uh, in onomatopoeia. So jay and crow and birds like that. Um, that's they, they got their name originally from uh, their, their calls. We still have a lot of names like that. Bobolink, it, 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 what a cool name for a bird. You know, if we came up with this by committee now, it'd probably be, be like yellow capped blackbird or something. But, but I want to leave some room open for us as we consider new names to come up with completely new words that no one has ever heard of before. That's extra confusing for folks, but it results in some of the coolest names I think you can get. Just some other Onom quick. Yep. Yeah. Some other just quick onomatopoeic that uh, you may or may not have known. Like, uh, of course, the song of the Eastern Wood Pee Wee. Obviously, our, our black capped chickadee has that wonderful chickadee dee dee, uh, the calls that they give. Um, you know, for a long time, I always thought Vireo was actually a, a part of, was a reference to, to their noise. Vireo is actually, um, it, the translation, um, is, is a small green bird, uh, funny, you know, what a fun naming with this, this Latin, uh, binomial here that the, uh, uh, Vireo olivaceus actually means like the green, little green bird, like great translation, um, uh, also funny that, you know, as you see on your screen here, red-eyed vireo, like they don't actually get a red eye until they mature. So here's one like in its hatch year in the fall when it has a brown eye. So again, now I think I'll, I'll stop screen sharing in a second as I turn it over to, to Nick um, and we'll, we'll quickly transition into uh, some of, some of Maine's birds and some of our... Go our fun recommendations. So what Doug and I have done, and first I should note, I've I've opened up the chat for everyone. I'm trusting everyone to be nice. It's fun to share our new names. Please be nice to each other. If anyone starts raising a fuss, we'll close the chat down again, but I wanna allow people to suggest their own names. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start and hopefully that works. You can see that, Doug? Looks great. Okay. So what Doug and I have done is we have uh, each selected five eponymic birds that occur in Maine, and we've gone through the process of figuring out what would be some other good names for them. So here we go. I am starting with this bird here, a beautiful bird, the Barrow's Golden Eye. And again, I want to keep everybody in mind, there is no good name. We don't know if the point of a name should be to make it easy for a new birder to understand, to ID it. We don't know if it should be based on something else that we like. So we're just going to go through this and we're going to see how it goes. I'm starting here with the Barrow's Golden Eye, one of my favorite birds, a, a winter visitor down here in Maine, if you're lucky, on certain lakes and ponds. Um, named for Sir John Barrow, an English civil servant who used to spend a lot of time in the Arctic. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with this uh, this duck here? So this is um, sexually dimorphic. So the males and females look differently. Um, we could um, look to its binomial name um, for uh, a potential new name. Um, Icelandica is the second part. So when this bird was originally sort of known to Western science, it was from its Icelandic population. And this bird was thought of as an Icelandic bird. Um, one of its earlier names was um, Icelandic Whistler. Uh, but as you can see from this range map, it's not really Icelandic. I mean, there is a strong population up there, but it's mostly really a, a, a Western Rockies, um, Northwestern Rockies bird. So I don't think using the old name of Icelandic Whistler is very helpful. I don't think there really is a geographic name that we could use uh, or anything that's good. Um, you know, this is a classic one where there is a field mark that you should know that is very helpful to the identification. This is one of the times where there are two golden eyes that we have in Maine. Um, they are, you know, very similar looking, um, especially from afar. There's a couple things that tell them apart. There's the amount of black on the body. There's the head shape. Um, but really, when I was learning uh, Barrow's golden eyes and trying to separate from common golden eyes, the thing you look for is that crescent, right? You look for the white crescent shaped patch on the head of the male bufflehead right behind the bill. 
And you know, at, as you're scanning a flock, you look for the oh, the circle, common circle, common circle. Oh, there's a crescent. That is a a barrow's golden eye. So, for my first attempt at renaming, I am suggesting. Oh, and let me say too, these are not made Audubon's uh, official recommendations. I don't know if we're ever going to have recommendations. This is Doug and I just making stuff up off the top of our head. So we're trying to do the best we can. I have come up with crescent faced golden eye. Crescent face golden eye. Doug, what do you think? I love it. It's descriptive. I I know what bird you're talking about when you say that name. There I we go. And what I'm trying to do here, I'm launching a poll. I would like some engagement here to see what folks think about crescent face golden eye. You like it? You don't like it? Let me know in the chat. Oh, I got three yes. Oh, I got yeses. Oh, holy so many yeses. A couple no's. One no. Wow, that makes me feel really good. Awesome. Um, I can't see the chat right now. Uh, ooh, teardrop golden eye. Mm. I like that. Pinch what is it? Gold, golden eye was also put in. Oh, I didn't. Is it? Do you it's get a tear, that, teardrop like... tattoo on your face if you kill someone in prison? Is that right? I wouldn't know. <laughs> Maybe there's something there. Maybe not. Maybe there's something there. But overall, this is great. Crescent face golden eye. Thank you very much for your thoughts. I'm feeling buoyed by them. Um, let's move on. Let's move on. Um, Cooper's Hawk. Ooh. We all love the Cooper's Hawk. Uh, the famous occipiter, just a big, tough, cool bird. Um, named for William Cooper, a conchologist, a naturalist and conchologist, a shell biologist. Um, didn't really have anything to do with Cooper's Hawk, but was named by uh, Lucien, uh, Charles Lucien Bonaparte for him. In 1828, this is a tough one, Cooper's Hawk. This is a tough one, I think. This is a bird that we all love. Like the, the golden eye, this is a bird that has a very similar species out there, right? We all struggle constantly with the sharp-shinned hawk versus Cooper's Hawk identification. However, in my mind, and, and we get these questions all the time, there isn't a great field mark on the Cooper's Hawk that separates it easily from Sharpton. There are field marks. I know there's the cap and the size and the legs and whatever, but to the average person, none of those things is nearly as, as helpful as the teardrop um, on the golden eye. So I don't think that I wanna choose a name that has anything to do with any field marks. It, it, and part of that too is because um, they're just too cool for a, a field mark name. These are some of the coolest, most powerful birds we have. Another thing that we did when I was looking back into uh, potential new names is I looked under, I looked for other sort of older colloquial names. Big blue darter, chicken hawk, flying cross, hen hawk, quail hawk, striker, and swift hawk. I'm going to hang on to those striker and swift hawk uh, pieces here. To introduce a, a sort of another topic we haven't talked of, uh, spoken of before, which is um, can we get bird names from addition, from other languages, right? Um, every, every American birder knows that uh, when you go to Hawaii, all the birds there, uh, the sort of American uh, uh, common names are the uh, traditional Hawaiian language names for those birds. Um, I want to make sure that as a part of this process going forward that we consider uh, um, um, American, or uh, what am I trying to say, uh, um, Native American names. So. Uh, all, different Native American languages across the country had names for uh, birds. Sometimes they were, you know, they aligned with uh, Western science idea of a species, sometimes not, but they should all be, I think, considered for potential new names. Um, and, uh, um, you know, whether or not they lined up with a particular species. And I really want to ensure in this process that um, uh, that tribes, uh, uh, that Native Americans um, have a seat at the table and have their opinions considered and their language is considered because these names were in existence uh, long ago. Um, Doug and I did some research into finding out uh, what in Maine, if there were any uh, tribes that had names for birds in Maine, and there were yes and no. Um, these were some um, good sources here. Um, one of one that stuck out to me was this Western Abenaki name, um, Seguanila, which meant smiter hawk. Because I'll tell you, when I look at a Cooper's hawk, smiting is what they do best. Um, most of the, if you go on eBird and do a search for photos of Cooper's hawk, almost all of them are like over something dead that is just killed, including this shoveler. They are tough, 
cool birds. And I feel like the essence of them is being tough and cool. And including that in the name is something I want to do. So I, uh, again, there's another Cooper sock going down. Uh, I think the best one is to focus on it being badass. I love that tribal name. I think Seguinilla, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I, that's the name that I would love. I think it's a it's a unique name. It's a it's a stands alone for a bird that deserves to be unique and standing alone. It's been lumped up with Sharpton Hawk too much. I think it should stand alone as Seguinilla. So let me uh, try that. And I've lost my. There we go. I'm going to start the poll here. Uh, for this one. Oops, I'm gonna share results of the Crescent Fates Gold and I. Thank you, I guess I have to do that. And how, okay, now I'm going to here. Sorry, I'm sort of doing these. Okay, Seguanilla, what do we think? A little, little more mixed. of the first one was, it's gonna be- Not, That's at a high bar. It's a little more mixed now, but we got 70, 30s, 65. There were Good. some, in the chat, there were things like the, uh, Mentioning Scott Wadensall calls it calls Cooper's the little T. Mm. Uh crested naped hawk, the blunt shinned hawk. Cool. <laughs> Get out of here. Get out of here. Hawk was a good one. Little goss hawk. So this would be a tough one. This would be a tough uh uh, you know, um, you know, we'd have to learn a new word. We'd have to, you know, uh, figure out how to use it. But I think certainly we can all agree that uh, Native American names and, and the languages that have existed for these species long ago should certainly be a part of the process and considerations for um, for our new names. I'll move on now to, did I share the results? No, okay. Stop sharing and back. Um, I'm going to move on now to Bick Nell's Thrush. Doug will talk about thrushes in more detail. Uh, if you want to call him that, he'll say, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> later on. But Bicknell's thrush, a very famous bird in Maine. Um, this is named after Eugene Bicknell. Um, he, he was a guy involved uh, in the sort of early understanding of the bird that became the Bicknell's thrush, identifying them in the Catskills. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a bird. Um, uh, okay. Part of the uh, this set of thrushes in Maine, we're not going to come up with a great descriptive name for them. Um, these birds here, uh, Bicknell's Great Cheek, Swainson's Hermit, and Veery that you see, all very similar in the way they look. Um, are there other ways that we could um, identify them? Maybe by their call. You know, famous uh, thrushes are these thrushes are famous for their songs. Um, all of which are have differences that you could that you could um, that uh, you could relate to people, but in my mind, the uh, name uh, coming up with a new name based on the song is sort of not ideal because they're not quite different enough, um, in my opinion. Um, the the thing we all recognize that is unique about Bicknell thrush is its habitat, right? It nests in these high stunted forests way up in you know the top of New England mountains. And I think for me, this is the essence of what you want to sort of get across with the name about a big nose thrush, that it, that, it, that it lives at this crazy high elevation. And not only that, but that it is an experience to, to try to go get them, right? We all have a story of the first time we went and saw a big nose thrush, and it involves having to hike the heck up a mountain or drive up the heck up a mountain or get a lift up, but you've got to go way up top. This is some pictures from a trip that Doug and I and some friends took this past summer up to the top of Sugarloaf. We hiked up, we started in the, in the beautiful sunshine and then just we hit torrential rain and wind and craziness. We, we were walking around, we had thought we had no chance of seeing Bicknell's thrush. Everything was down and ground. The last possible spot before we get out of their habitat, we saw one, look how excited I am. You know, we were all so pumped. That's sort of the essence of, of the experience of a Bicknell thrush, I think. And so I wanted to make sure that we named it after that. And so what I went with is summit thrush, summit thrush. When you see this bird, you feel like you've conquered the summit of birding. You are literally at the summit of a mountain, most likely, um, unless you're one of those people who thinks they can identify them in, uh, in migration. Um, so I think summit thrush, I think it's a cool name and I wanna see what you all think uh, about this one. Oh, that was actually it, also yes. put in the chat. Was uh, it before I did it? Yeah, Sky David. Island. David came up uh, as soon as you you showed it. Uh, Montane thrush, 
couple of people went with the uh crumb holes thrush yeah that's a cool one um karen mentioned uh why not hispanola thrush to mm -hmm. give a nod to its its wintering grounds non-breeding grounds we should say that's like another thing our, our northern centric uh naming rights yeah um well but i don't know i'm at 97 percent right now and that feels yeah. pretty good to me i'm gonna end the poll right there before it goes bad <laughs> look at that i feel good about that summit thrush Nice. Awesome. I'm going to go even a little faster. I know I want to make sure that we're on time. I have, do I have two more? Did I do? Yeah. Um, Lincoln's sparrow, Lincoln sparrow, uh, a beautiful bird, a very underrated sparrow, in my opinion, um, a gorgeous little bird. The only bird currently named for someone from Maine. Um, Thomas Lincoln of Denny'sville was a friend of John James Audubon. Um, this is such a, a fantastic little bird. Because it's the only bird named after someone from Maine, I'm wondering, hey, could we call it the Maine Sparrow? Why, why give up something like that? Uh, no, we should not do that. This bird is not unique to Maine in any way. Uh, it breeds across the country, down into you know California. Um, we should not name it the Maine Sparrow. Um, what should we name it after? You know, this is kind of a tough one. Um, Doug and I talked a little bit about this. It's a little tough one. This is one um, that I find most commonly is um, confused with the Song Sparrow. Um, and, and and when we talk about sort of reliable ID features for this, there is some of the song, but I find it's really the, the contrast between the white belly and the buffy chest with the fine streaking as compared to sort of the sloppy streaking on a song sparrow's breast there on the side. Um, on eBird, they put it as uh, like a pen and ink drawing on the Lincoln Sparrow versus an oil painting on the song sparrow. Um, I, I like that a lot. Um, and I think this bird overall is just when you see one, it's such a clean, sort of nice looking tight bird. Um, this is the picture of its back. Look how just like clean and, and smart looking that is. And so when I was thinking of names, I went through some of the uh, synonyms for, for sort of well-dressed, uh, classy, dashing, rakish, spry, stylish. I landed on this one, the Dapper Sparrow. The Dapper Sparrow. I love it. I think it's befitting this bird. I think it doesn't get much respect now as it is. It's sort of lumped in this ambiguous thing. But I think if people are saying, oh, Dapper Sparrow, I want to go see that. Um, I don't know what you think. Let me find my poll here. Let's see. I'm bracing myself um, for, uh, oops, um, back. I'm bracing myself for this one. It won't let me launch it. Uh, sorry, hold on. I guess I didn't end sharing the other one um there we go and all right let me see dapper sparrow what do you got be kind yes oh ooh, ah, ooh, ooh, doing good ooh, ooh. bounce back for 75 percent. 36 say no what a, what a, doug what else do we have uh in the chat oh this is my worst so yet. a couple of people put buff breasted sparrow in the chat early mm -hmm. on it's mm -hmm. a good one for that color um Jen, as, as you were describing, the, like some of the artistic techniques mm -hmm. uh, came up with the etching sparrow, which oh. um, you could uh, uh, you could imagine like carving out, uh, doing a little etching to to make this um, buffed sparrow uh, and, and formal sparrow, just uh, formal sparrow. Yeah, I this is my worst yet. Fifty seven percent. Forty three. No, that's OK. Um, I'm just doing my best. I think. It's the, the crispness and beauty of the plumage of this bird is what what uh, sets it apart. And so I'll go. Doug, do we want to do our fifth or should we turn it over to you? Uh, let's do it. I don't know. Okay. I'm going to do my if fifth. I'll go quickly. This real is... board of this. They can they can leave if we're Sure, you can drop off. Um, I'm having fun. This is what I have not talked to Doug about. He does not know what I named this one. This isn't my fanciest name. It's okay. Um, Leech's Storm Petrol. Holy cow. Um, a very cool sort of secretive shorebird that nests off some islands on the main coast, um, named after uh, an English zoologist, uh, William Elford Leach. Um, very cool bird, a tough one to name. So there are 25 different species of storm petrels around the world. They each are generally have the same sort of body, um, uh, you know, a uh, tube nose seabird, um, brownish gray, blackish back, uh, secondary coverts of some contrasting color, oftentimes a white rump. Um, there isn't really a ton about the leech's storm petrel that sets it apart uh, by its physical characteristics. It, it, 
compared to the Wilson Storm Petrel, the other common one we have in Maine, this one is larger and longer winged, but that doesn't really work across its range. The, the scientific name um, means basically white rump, which is also not helpful because they all have white rump. Um, I looked a little bit into the Birds of Maine, this famous old old book um, uh, that included some colloquial names. And one of the names they had was the Cary Chicken. I wanted to know what the Cary Chicken was. Did you guys know that Mother Cary was a, a supernatural figure personifying the cruel and threatening sea in the imagination of 18th and 19th century sailors, possibly married to Davy Jones? Hey, you learn something new every day. But we're not doing eponyms, so we, we can't do Carrie's chicken. We, we have to leave her out of it. Um, what are some other unusual things about this bird? One is its flight style, right? So folks who see it out to sea know that it flies like a, like a bat. It sort of bounces around really erratically. Um, that could be sort of a helpful uh, uh, name for one to do. Like you could do bat-like uh, bat -like storm petrel. Um, that's just too many hyphens in there. Erratic storm petrel, maybe, I don't know. The other thing that is cool is that these birds are, are pretty much strictly nocturnal around their breeding grounds. They are, they are wary of predation from gulls and skuas and other birds. And so they come and go from their burrows at night, at night. And so I lean into that a little bit for my suggested name, which is the midnight storm petrel. The midnight storm petrel. Um, I think there's some sort of, it's an evocative name. You know, you know that you have to get lucky to see them. Um, and um, and I couldn't find a better word for night, but I think midnight storm petrol has, oh, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting hammered in the pole. Um, <laughs> oops. Um, forked storm petrol I see, not a leech storm petrol, wavering storm petrol. I think that's Melissa, that's a good name. Um, not too bad, all right. Uh, 64 say yes for midnight. Thank you for my people out there. Um, and uh, we'll go there. So that's those are my five. And I'm going to turn it over to Doug, who does an even much better PowerPoint than I do for his him to do his five. Uh, and as I'm pulling it up, I want to acknowledge, um, sorry, I've, I lost the name. Was it Jane? Someone put in um, fork-tailed storm petrol. And this is one of the toughest things I've learned is like, there's a lot of really good names that are already taken. There already is a fork-tailed right. uh, storm petrel. So I'll do my best to avoid names already used. Are you you guys are looking at my full yeah, screen? Yeah, looks good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to dive right in, uh, some of the birds that I did, I started with Swainson's thrush. Uh, why not? It's 2023. Let's use the technology we have available to us. The the smartest thing on the planet, as some might want us to believe, is ChatGPT. Uh, so I asked ChatGPT, what would be a good new name for Swainson's thrush? And I do like that it answered with, choosing a new name for a species involves care, careful consideration for its characteristics, habitats, and any distinguishing features. And it says, since I don't have specific information about Swainson's thrush, I'll suggest a general name that reflects the bird's traits. And it came up with the forest serenade thrush, which is a little bit of a mouthful for me. Uh, not going to settle on that, so let's keep looking. Uh, just like Nick did, I went to the 1908 Birds of Maine by uh, Aura Knight. Um, one of the several names um, uh, uh, that were listed here, so you can see there's Swainson's thrush, um, olive backed, we'll talk about in a second. The fly catching thrush I thought was cool, but I really liked uh, mosquito thrush because um, you'll often, when, you, when you're looking at a Swainson's thrush, you're probably in some habitat that you're getting destroyed by mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, so I, I like that as a name. Another uh, uh, Native American name, um, uh, the Penobscot here in Maine um, only had one word to describe all the, the species of thrushes in Maine, but I do like, uh, again, thinking about like the, the behavior of these birds, um, the, the translation meant the evening caller, which was fun to kind of think of uh, tying in with this. Uh, then my mind took this, this big pivot towards like taxonomy and thinking about how these birds are distributed. I mentioned a lot of people um, know Swainson's thrush here in the east as olive-backed thrush. And so I was like, I was like, that's it. That's a nice descriptive 
The problem is Swainson's thrush currently makes up a, a number of subspecies. You can see them all listed here. So we have the olive-backed um, here in the east, and it does um, expand all the way up into uh, Alaska, um, which, fun fact, that the one up in Alaska is called um, uh, uh, Incanus, if that's the right way to say it, which is like hoary-headed or hoary-naped. So like if we could if we could split all of these, fast forward taxonomy and get like the 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 hoary headed thrush like i love need more thrushes <laughs> yeah so i want to let's maintain olive back and russet backed in the in the hope that someday these these birds get split so can't use those names uh the song much as nick talked about the the song of bicknell's um this is just showing a spectrogram frequency over time. This is a spectrogram of, of Swainson's thrush song. It's very unique. It has a nice ascending nature to it, but it's kind of a mouth mouthful to say the the crescendo songed thrush. Upscale um, thrush, says Craig Kesselheim. Nice. Um, so that's unique, but that's, that's a tough one. Uh, Birders that like going out at night and listening to nocturnal flight calls. Swainson's thrush has one of the most distinct NFCs of any any bird that you're going to hear migrating. And, and it was fun to think about because the vast majority of Swainson's thrushes that I hear are usually like migrating birds at night. You can go out on a good uh, spring or especially fall night and hear dozens, if not hundreds of them fly over with this, this call that sounds just like a spring peeper. So how could we tie in like the spring peeper thrush or I was looking at the um, the genus that spring peepers are in is uh, Pseudocris, which actually translates to fake locust. So if they if they're like the fake spring peeper, are they the fake fake locust or does the double negative work? And now they're like the locust thrush. No, uh, I didn't go with any of these. This is the fun thought process to go through with all of it. To try and narrow in on a name, I did look at, you know, these are a couple things from the the Sibley guide, uh, looking at uh, the Collins guide, the, the most popular guide for most uh, European birds. And everywhere you look, um, the birds always described as having these spectacles, distinct spectacles or these prominent eye ring. Um, so I thought like spectacled thrush would be a great name. Except there's Alas. much like our fork-tailed uh, storm petrel, there's already a bird named spectacled thrush. Uh, fun looking on the species account that they are also known as the bear-eyed thrush. So I wish we could let's let's rename that one as well. Give us spectacled back. But keeping that that in mind, I really like referencing this this unique eye. As Nick mentioned, I have one big problem with the word thrush is that thrushes should be things in the genus Turtus. Things like our sooty thrush, white-eyed thrush, um, all of these large thrushes, things like American robin, shouldn't be called a robin. It should be called a thrush. It should you're getting, be- You're getting hammered in the pole for this. Oh, I bet. So Swainson's thrush is a catharist thrush. Everywhere else, catharist thrushes are called nightingale thrush, which is such a beautiful- mouthful of a name so if we're going with a mouthful of a name why not the buffering nightingale thrush i'll tell you why not because and i break 50 percent. <laughs> <It's... laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh no oh no here we go i should say too in the chat uh tim flight uh the lesser summit thrush which um Nice. Not, not gonna fly, but I love it. Goggle thrush says Jen. Ooh, and I'm I'm just gonna end this here before this gets any uglier. Yeah, um, that I is a sixty-two percent no dice nightingale okay. thrush. Too many hyphens. Too many hyphens. Oh, just enough. I see. <laughs> I see what you're saying. All right, it can All only right. go. It can only get better from here, Doug. I hope so. This will be a much faster one because it's it's easy. There's no disputing what this bird should be called. So Bonaparte skull, um, there are lots of gulls in the world, um, lots of different seagulls that all have very similar uh, field marks. Seagulls are just confusing. There are too many gulls of the sea. Fortunately, 
Bonaparte's gull is a gull of the tree. It is the only gull that regularly nests in trees. So let's call this the tree gull. The tree gull. I <laughs> love it. It's not useful, perhaps, uh, unless you're up on the breeding grounds. But I think in terms of it being a, the, what actually separates this from all other gulls, like the rhyme with the tree gull, it's going to confuse a lot of people. Do you say tree gull or seagull? Yeah. I love it. And you're getting some support getting some strong support. Dainty gull says Anne, black-headed tree gull. Mm. I love it. That was a fun one. Uh, there is the black-headed gull, which is a European species. So um, someone I was chatting with was like, call, you know, like, call it the, the European black-headed gull and the American black-headed gull. Mm. Um, we love long names. Well, good job. You're in the positive this time, 69 to 31. Great job. Nice. Um, Nelson Sparrow. Um, uh, and sorry, I, I, I know Nick was doing a good job honoring uh, these people. I'm not trying to uh, uh, leave out names, but do want to um, <laughs> not discredit any of these these names that are out there. So um, anyways, uh, Nelson Sparrow, actually a, a bird near and dear to my heart after working in the Scarborough Marsh for many years, helping with some demographic studies of these birds. I've held more of these birds in my hand than than any other. Um, I do love the name Nelsons, but a fun one to look at was some of the different uh, uh, translations around the world, um, which you can you can get on the Birds of the World website. Um, I really looking down these. A lot of them do just translate back into Nelson Sparrow, um, but this one, the Icelandic word. Um, which, according to Google Translate, uh, is is pronounced the um, uh, if I say this right, the the vice a tittle gore, which I think uh, talk about a, a fun name. I wish I could walk through the Scarborough Marsh and just point out the the vice a tittle gore calling over there. We're getting um, people saying no in the chat already. <laughs> nice. This is this is why I'm not on the NA. <laughs> One word that I wish that we could take back because it's not used in enough uh, bird names. Um, so John James Audubon, as we've discussed, has a uh, kind of uh, interesting history, not only in some of his uh, uh, incredibly racist uh, actions, but also in his kind of ornithological background, there are some species that uh, can really be called into question. Like one of these mysteries here, a bird that he um, illustrated uh, called the carbonated swamp warbler. There's a lot of questions whether this was a possible hybrid that he just found in one location, whether the bird was completely fabricated um, um, at all. Uh, carbonated, I'll quickly acknowledge, is a reference to this kind of carbon, this burnt sooty look that you get on birds. Uh, the only other carbonated bird we have here is this carbonated Sierra Finch, you can see that nice black belly on it. Nelson Sparrow does not have that that uh, wash per se, but that is one of the coolest words that's not used enough. And if you have ever heard a Nelson Sparrow has one of the most distinctive noises, it's often described as either hot water hitting a pan or cracking open a carbonated beverage, that wonderful little So, why shouldn't we call Nelson Sparrow carbonated sparrow? I love it. I love it. It's, a, it's an outstanding word. It is accurate and helpful, but still creative and evocative. I'm all for it. We, we let's see, we also do have sizzling sparrow, a couple of votes for sizzling sparrow, soda pop sparrow, bringing back sharp tailed sparrow. <laughs> do you like, yeah. Do that. That's funny. That, while we no. let this one for one second, it's a very funny thing that when in 1995, when these two species were split, we got it used to be sharp tailed sparrow. It was split into the salt marsh sharp tailed sparrow and the Nelson's sharp tailed sparrow. And then it was like 2000, I don't know the year, um, not that long ago, the names were shortened just to be easier to say. So this idea that like we need to like preserve some names is is just, it's kind of silly to me to just think that like 
we just shorten these names to make them easier to say. So clearly I like the long hyphenated ones, but <laughs> we have a fajita sparrow, which is as someone who hasn't <laughs> had dinner yet is a great option. I think a couple more votes for sizzling and soda pop fizzy flood tide. Good times, but 80% on carbonated. Uh, All right. uh, good job. Um, last couple here, uh, Wilson's warbler, um, uh, uh, fun bird named after Alexander Wilson, uh, uh, the often called the father of American ornithology, who, you know, uh, again, a great person to have a bird named after, but if we're going to be removing all of these, um, uh, these eponyms, let's come up with a better name. I want to start by saying nothing yellow. There are already too many. We have yellow warbler. We've got yellow throat, which isn't even the yellow throated warbler. Uh, I want no nothing with yellow in it. So I was trying to think about this bird. Uh, when I started birding, uh, always trying to come up with like different either mnemonics or or ways to remember a bird name. And I would always remember it as um, Mr. Wilson from um, Dennis the Menace. If anyone knew the the which uh, hero.fandom.com considers uh, Mr. Wilson a do-gooder. Uh, fun fact, learned that today. Um, but in my memory, I always thought that he had a little uh, toupee. I guess he was he was only bald in the the cartoons. Um, but I would always remember his, I can just see little Dennis the Menace going after uh, uh, his poor neighbor here. So I would always make that association of having like that little toupee, the little dark cap um, with Mr. Wilson. Um, toupees really do <laughs> a lot. <laughs> toupees can really do a lot for anyone. Um we can get a little, uh, if folks don't remember this episode of Seinfeld, when- He does look great there, I will say. He does George. look great. This is a great scene, um, talking to the uh, woman at the restaurant who kicks her chair out for him. Um, this is also Jason Alexander, a little nod to Alexander Wilson. Uh, ah. Just just saying this all, it all ties him up. that a toupee is really not appreciated enough. So let's call this- the uh two paid <laughs> i hate it and i also love it uh you know we talked about trying to give birds their dignity back i'm not sure this accomplishes <laughs> that um there are as oh we're and you're getting hammered where well, there are yeah. you know uh yamaka warbler is something you know beret there's lots of hats that are equivalents of this thing a beret a fez uh any lots of sort of uh you know skull cap area hats could could work here but it does look like a toupee it's sort of a, 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 a black hairy thing that on there so it's accurate whether people like it or not and the guess they guess what they don't uh, like it uh, 68 mm. say no dice to two paid warbler if listen to me if you are if you were a casual person walking by a bird walk and they said oh look here comes a two paid warbler you tell me you wouldn't stop and look at that bird. This this would introduce more new people to birds than than any other anything else. The last one, um, and, and I'm glad I, I don't have the chat open anymore uh, uh, so <laughs> to help me get through this. Um, Black Bernie and Warbler is a fun one because uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that this is an eponym um, named after uh, Anne or Anna. Blackburn, uh, an English naturalist. Um, and it was actually um, uh, Alexander Wilson who named this bird um, after uh, Lady Blackburn. Um, this was another fun one. Um, which was it here? Uh, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, the, the translations are, are not my, my pronunciations, I should say. Uh, uh, Fitch and Witzinger was the the German um again pardon my pronunciation but but Fitchenwitzinger I thought was another that would be, just be a fun word to to get to say when you're pointing up at something like Blackburnian warbler high up uh in the treetops 
Um, some of the other names actually translated to uh, spruce warbler, which I actually really liked um, thinking about some of the, the habitats that you see these in. We do have a bunch of warblers that are named, you know, after different plants that you're likely to see them in, um, even ones you're unlikely to see them in. So, so spruce warbler, I did really like, um, but these birds, uh, the, the color, the way, you know, the way that you're looking up through, you know, a pinhole in the forest. And as soon as you see these bright glowing colors, the number of times I've said like, oh, that bird looks like it's on fire. Um, even, you know, yes, the males are, are stunning, but even when you see some of these, you know, drabber juvenile birds or even females in the fall, um, they still just have this nice glow to them. So uh, to come up with a new name for Blackburnian Warbler, I really liked the the fire-faced warbler. Yes. Uh, it, it, it would be hard to name this bird after anything other than the bright orange on its face. It is the, it's the thing that everybody remembers, I think. And we were getting a lot of similar uh, ones in the chat. Flame-throated warbler, fire-throated warbler. Um, they said the ABA podcast said ember warbler, um, mm. day-glow warbler, some other good ones, fire-throated um, I love it. I think fire throated flame throated is unfortunately taken by a uh, Central American. Uh, Costa Rica is a great place to see flame throated. Cool looking bird. Very cool. You, you've got the crowd on board. Seventy seven percent say say good job. Well done. Way to end on a high note. And we are ending on a high note, everyone. Look, isn't this fun to do? This is an opportunity that our modern people have never had. You know, we have never had a say in the names of our birds. Um, and so I and Doug, we are, you know, ex this is exciting. We get a chance to sit down and think about these birds, to look at them anew, to think about what makes them them, and to understand, you know, what we want to call them uh, later on. So um, my uh, my final words is thank you everyone for coming. I'm putting the donate uh, link back in the chat. If you appreciate this type of thing um, in Maine, this is uh, uh, this is Maine Audubon doing our fun thing. So we appreciate any donations you may have. Um, Doug, any final thoughts? No, I'll just uh, reiterate the thank you. I'll encourage folks to join us again. We have a lot of really fun programs, especially coming up with the new year. Uh, the, our um, Birding Basics series starting the first week of January. Uh, I think next week we've got virtual birding on Tuesday, Monday or Monday night. Uh, might be with uh, Andy Kapanos, just looking at birds all over the world on some some webcams. You can bird from your 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 uh, the, the comfort of your home. So, so awesome. we've got all sorts of fun stuff, and I, I hope to see a bunch of you uh, either in person or virtually. Monday says Jen for virtual birding program. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a great night and good burning.